sponsored by Brilliant. I'm Rene Ritchie. Hit subscribe so you don't miss any of my WWDC 2020 deep dives, like this, iPadOS 14 for the iPad. iPadOS 14 runs on every iPad from the 2014 iPad Air 2 to the 2015 iPad Mini 2 to the 2017 iPad all the way to all of the iPad Pros. In other words, if you're running iPadOS 13 today, you'll be able to run iPadOS 14 when it ships. As always, that doesn't mean every single new feature will be there for every iPad, but the basic stuff and the security updates at the very least. A bunch of the new features coming in iPadOS 14 are part of the core iOS 14 update. Things like the new group features and messages, all the new Memoji looks, the bike, EV, and congestion routing in Maps. I've done a whole video on all of that already. So seriously, hit subscribe and check it out. I won't duplicate any of that here, but I will point out some major differences. Also, for anyone saying the iPad got short shift this year, including me in a moment, just remember that Apple kind of dropped trackpad and cursor support, all surprise casual-like, just a few months ago. And while that would have made a hella great WWDC segment, I am happy we got it as part of iPadOS 13.4 and didn't have to wait a half a year for 14.0 to ship. Just like iOS 14, iPadOS 14 is getting the newly redesigned widgets, the ones that have leveraged everything Apple learned from the watch complications to make them even more informationally dense and more glanceably legible than ever before, including stacks and smart stacks. But as Apple will tell you, these new widgets are not meant to be mini apps. And that means unlike the previous today widgets, you can't interact with them, like at all, no buttons, no fields, certainly no calculators. All you can do is tap them to go straight to their host app. Now that might might be a limitation due to their Swift UI watch complication origin, because there's no way to really interact with elements that small. But at iPad scale especially, it also feels like a regression. So hopefully, it's really just a first step towards a better, more interactive widget future for everyone. Also, unlike the iPhone where you can place widgets in amongst the app grid, on the iPad, widgets are still constrained and locked to the sidebar introduced last year in iPadOS 13. So you get the visual benefits of the new widgets, just not the spatial ones. I've heard that this is because Apple felt the bigger iPad display meant they didn't have to cram the widgets into the grid. But I've also heard the tight deadlines just meant they haven't had time to do that yet. While I like the clean look of the sidebar, arbitrary widget placement is just so much more functional. So I'm hoping it's much more the latter than the former. Same with the app library, which is the new organization system for all your apps, the one that puts them into smart folders at the end of the homepage stack on the iPhone and is just completely MIA on the iPad. Again, I've heard Apple may not feel like it's needed on the bigger iPad screen with a dynamic dock and workspaces multitasking interface, or that Apple just didn't have time to implement it yet. Either way, like Gollum in the One Ring, I want it. If you want it too, drop a like below so they can see the numbers. For app interfaces on the iPad this year, Apple is leaning heavily into sidebars. Split view controllers, or having the list on one side and the contents on the other, has basically been the iPad standard since it launched a decade ago. But these sidebars take organization and sophistication to the next level, an almost Mac-like level, you could say, especially since you can not only tap to reveal contents now, but drag and drop to reorganize that content. Not coincidentally, that should also make iPad apps run better on Apple Silicon Macs and make them even easier to adapt into Catalyst apps. Same with the return to fashionable popovers and the new pull downs, which are essentially drop downs. Sadly, the classic spinning time and date picker, which lost its photorealism with iOS 7, has lost its everything with iOS and iPadOS 14. It's now just a functionally non delightful number entry, and I want the original back badly. The compact interfaces coming to iOS 14 are also coming to iPadOS 14, but make an even bigger difference on the even bigger screens. Again, you can check out my iOS 14 video for all the details on phone, FaceTime, and Siri. I already mentioned how I wish I could drag Siri result notifications into widgets to keep them around if I need to reference them again. But it'd be great to be able to temporarily just pin any notification if you want to, so you can navigate around to look up other things without just blowing them away. With the new search, it at least persists what you were recently doing if you tap off and then call it back. It's also universal now, like macOS search, or basically type to Siri, which isn't just great for consistency, it's great for utility. App clips work on the iPad, same as the iPhone, but can't access NFC because no NFC on the iPad. Also, since there's no app library, if you want to find them again and reuse them, they'll hang out in the dynamic dock and the multitasking workspace interface instead. Game Center has gotten a cross-Apple platform 
reboot. There's a new access point, so it's no longer sign in and forget in. You can just tap the AP to see your highlights. You can also tap on your profile pic to go to an in-game dashboard with your friends, achievements, and leaderboard status. You can tap in further to, for example, get friend recommendations, change your profile settings, and more. Pretty much the entire experience has been updated and polished, including multiplayer mode. It's like the best of the old Game Center, minus green felt, plus consistency and ubiquity, and I hope every game dev adopts it. Also, and really cool, Game Center is now integrated into the App Store as well. So on the tab pages like Game and Arcade and the individual game pages, you can see what your Game Center friends are playing, and that can help you decide what you want to play next. To either challenge them or, you know, avoid them completely. And while only tenuously related, Apple is also bringing keyboard and mouse gaming to the iPad. That means, theoretically, games like Fortnite and Minecraft can just get a hell of a lot better. Apps have to ask you before they can track you now, just like they have to ask for camera or contact or location permission. You can choose to share an approximate location instead of your exact GPS coordinates now as well, if you feel like that's all the specific app really needs. You can also limit an app to only specific photos instead of giving them access to your entire photo library. Apple's also giving accessory makers access to the Find My network, which is both better for privacy and for antitrust allegations. And if the mic or camera gets turned on by any app for any reason, you get a dot in the status bar and control center telling you that they're on. Safari will privately, through cryptographic derivation, which breaks my brain just trying to say, check your passwords against known breaches and alert you if they've been breached, privately. Even Apple doesn't know about it. And also let you change any available accounts to sign in with Apple if you don't want to keep around the individual passwords anymore. And I love this so much. There's no new Translate app for the iPad like there is for the iPhone, which just adds so much more bummer to the already huge no calculator or weather app bummer pile. But you can translate web pages with Apple if you don't want to share what you're translating with Google. And you can tap the privacy report button at any time to see all the cross-site trackers that Safari is auto-blocking for you. And I guess we'll find out soon enough if anyone can hear data harvesters scream in ad space. Kit 4 applies to both the iPhone and the iPad, but it's got a few features exclusive to devices with the fancy new LiDAR scanner, which is just the iPad Pro for now. First, the Depthy API can now use LiDAR to provide even more precise data for virtual objects and more advanced photo and video editing effects. LiDAR is also powering better object occlusion, which means virtual objects passing behind real-world objects, like Pikachu running behind a tree. You can also place AR experiences at the coordinates of famous landmarks and places around the world. And yeah, I'm so hoping for Kong at the Empire State Building. And there's video textures in Reality Kit, so you can map a movie screen to your wall, facial expressions to a Lego head, ripples to a sink, pretty much anything you want to animate. Headphone accommodations and accessibility let you customize exactly the audio experience you want, amplifying soft sounds, adjusting frequencies, even making a personal profile, basically letting you adjust anything you need to hear as much as you possibly can. So, confession, true facts, for real, all of that. As much as I love the trackpad and cursor support we just got, I love the new pencil support we're getting even more. See, trackpad and cursor make the iPad more like a traditional computer. Pencil makes it more like a traditional notebook. First, if you draw a simple shape, like a circle, oval, square, rectangle, triangle, star, pentagon, heart, single or double-ended straight or curved arrow, cloud, or word bubble, you pause at the end with the pencil tip still down, it'll be automatically converted into a smooth geometric shape. More complicated shapes will either be simplified to one of the more basic shapes or ignored completely. Yes. You heard me, you TTP types. Next, Apple is treating handwriting like typed writing, which means they're using machine learning systems to identify writing from doodling and other arbitrary pencil marks, and recognizing the individual characters and the strings that they make up. They're even running machine learning models to generate uncommon samples, like handwritten URLs, to train the recognition models. And I both love and fear this stuff so much. Also, you can handwrite something, select it, copy it, paste it as is, or as typed text, change color, move it, whatever. If what you write triggers a data detector, like a phone number, email address, physical address, or web address, all the addresses, they'll even be turned into links so you can tap on them to go to FaceTime, Mail, Maps, and Safari. It's great. Also, if you're using a pencil, you shouldn't have to put it down to do other things with your iPad. So Apple's providing a floating palette that contains the most common functions for whatever app you're in, so you can quickly pencil tap right on them. 
and two, you can now scribble into any text field that you could previously type into. Scribble on iPad is similar to Scribble on the Apple Watch, just at iPad scale. So instead of one character at a time, you can just write and Scribble will just convert it to type right behind you. As long as you start in the field, you can even stray out of the field. You can also circle words with the pencil to select them or scratch them out to delete them. It's really terrifyingly cool technology, especially the way it works. Here's an example from Brilliant's new Neural Networks course. You can wire up just 50 neurons and using that type of feedback, build a network that's capable of classifying handwritten digits. But really recognizing and classifying almost everything eventually. It's the total future of technology. So whether you're a student looking to get ahead while school's out, a professional who wants to brush up on cutting edge topics, or someone who just wants to understand, maybe even help change the world, check out Brilliant. Go to brilliant.org slash Rene Ritchie and sign up for free. And the first 200 of you can also level up with 20% off the annual premium subscription. Thanks, Brilliant. Thanks to all of you for your support. Check out the WWC playlist for more, and see you next video.